Welcome to Reading User Input from the Keyboard with Python. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This is an introductory course to getting a response from your users through the use of the built-in input function. The input function returns a string, so if you want to deal with numeric types, you'll need to convert the response. And in doing that conversion, problems can arrive, so this course talks about how to write error handling code as well. Finally, if you need input but don't want the user's response on the screen, there's a method for password-like input that gets covered, too. Code in this course was tested using Python 3.14. Almost everything in here has been around for a long time, though, so any actively supported version of Python will be sufficient. Sometimes you want your programs to ask the user for some information. You can prompt them for an answer using the built-in input function. Input returns a string value, so if you need a number, you'll have to convert it. And conversion comes with problems. You can't convert dog to a number, and users can be tricky about what they type, so you need to know how to handle conversion errors. When prompted by input, the user sees what they are typing. Most of the time, that's what you want. But what about things like passwords? Well, the getPass function in the module of the same name doesn't echo key presses to the screen giving you another choice for giving a response from the user. It's time to get started. In the next lesson, I'll demonstrate the built-in input function. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll show you how to use the built-in input function. Built-in functions are those that you can use directly in Python without having to import them first. Input is one such built-in function. It asks the user for a response, and then waits for them to type something in. Input takes a single argument, a string that the function shows as a prompt to the user. The return value of input is also a string, even if the user types in numbers. In a future lesson, I'll show you how to deal with that, but for now, let's stick with the string responses. For about half of this course, I'll be demonstrating code in the Python REPL. If you haven't come across that term before, REPL stands for Read, Eval, Print Loop. It's an interactive Python session where it reads what you type, evaluates it as a Python statement, prints the result of the evaluation to the screen, and then prompts you for the next thing, looping back. Your IDE likely has a REPL built in, or you can run one by invoking Python on the command line without any arguments. Once you run it, you'll be prompted with three greater than symbols. That's where you can type some Python and see the result. For example, if you call print, you'll see the printed value. I'm going to start a REPL session right now to demonstrate the input function. Since the input function is built in, I don't need to import anything to use it. I can just call it directly. So let me do just that. Input takes a string as an argument. The string you give it is a prompt for the user. When I hit enter here, Python prints the prompt and waits for my response. What's your name is the prompt. And there I've typed a response. When I hit enter, the REPL shows the return value from the function call, which in this case is a string containing what I typed, the name Vincent. Note that I'm using Python 3.14, which added colorization to the REPL. It knows what a prompt line is and colors it in bold magenta. If you were running the same code in a program, or in an older version of the Python REPL, you'd only get plain text. Later in the course, when I'm using a script, this won't be colorized. Unless you're playing around in the REPL, you typically want to capture the response of the input function. Let me run this again, but this time store the result. Similar code to before, the same prompt, and the same answer. This time, the REPL shows nothing. When you assign something in the REPL, nothing gets returned, so there's nothing to evaluate, which means the REPL doesn't print anything out. It did, however, store our answer in the variable name. You can evaluate the content of a variable simply by entering it into the REPL. Typing in the variable name causes the REPL to evaluate it and print its contents. Since it is a variable, I can also show it on the screen by calling the print function. Print can take more than one argument. Here, I've given it two. The first argument is the string hello, while the second is our name variable. 
Print then combines all of its arguments, putting a space between each of them, and outputs the result to the screen like you see here. Note a subtle difference between printing the name and evaluating it. When you evaluate the name variable, the REPL puts quotes around it because it's a string, whereas print outputs the contents to the screen, so there's no quotes. If you want to do fancier things with your output, you might want to use an F string. An F string is a way of constructing a new string where you can embed the evaluation of variables inside of it. You denote an F string with the letter F as a prefix, and you indicate the variables you want to evaluate in the string with brace brackets. Let me print one out. Although the output here is the same as above, I constructed it differently. In the first version of the print, there was a string and a variable. In the second version, there's only an F string. Inside the F string, name gets evaluated because it's surrounded in brace brackets. So the interpreter's evaluation of the F string is a single string containing hello Vincent, all of which is then handed to print, which print then prints out, giving us the same thing as above. In this case, you could use either method I've shown you to get to the same place, but F strings are fairly powerful and allow for formatting and other cool things. If you haven't played with them before, I highly suggest you put an F string course on your to do list. So far, I've been calling input with a prompt argument. You can also call it without one. The user still gets to enter something, only the prompt is empty, meaning it's a blank line. Let me type something in. And like before, the response is a string which the REPL displayed. The first time you see there was no prompt was me typing. The second time it's in quotes, that's the return result of the input, the string containing there was no prompt. I don't recommend using input without an argument, as it likely will confuse your users. But hey, you might have a special case where you want no prompt. The input function always returns a string. So if you want numbers as input, then you have to convert the response. I'll show you how to do that in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, I introduced the input function. In this lesson, I'll show you how to convert its string responses to other data types. When you ask the user to type something in, they're always typing text, even if that text is numeric digits. So if your program actually needs an integer or a float, then you have to convert the string into another data type. You do this with data type constructors. Let's head back to the REPL to see how they work. While converting between data types can be important when dealing with user input, it can also be used generally. So before getting to the input case, let's just do some regular old data type conversion. Most of the conversion I'm going to show you is from strings to something else. So let's start by examining a string. Typing a string directly into the REPL causes it to be evaluated, and similar to evaluating a variable with a string in it, you get a string as the output response. You can see what type something is in Python by passing it to the built-in type function. Everything in Python is an object, and one way of representing an object is a class. A class specifies how something behaves while the object is an instance of that thing. The type of my hello is a string class. You see that here with the words class and str for string. Let's try something else. 42 is a number. More specifically, it's an instance of an integer class. 9.13 is also a number, but the decimal place means it isn't an integer. It's an instance of the float class. You can create a new instance of a class using the class's constructor. For strings, integers, and floats, the constructor looks a lot like a function. Although on the surface, this might look like a function because it's got parentheses, it really is a class constructor. The string class constructor takes an argument, which is the thing you want to turn into a string. When you pass in 42, an integer, what you get back is those digits inside of a string. Since a string constructor returns a string object instance, it of course follows that what is returned is of type string class. Okay, so how do you use this with input from the user? Here, I'm going to store what the user types into a variable named age. Let me hit enter. There's my prompt and my answer. Let's examine it. The variable age now contains 2, 1. Pay close attention. 
There are quotes around it. Yep, it's a string. No matter what you type into an input prompt, you always get a string back. You can convert it though. Like with the string constructor, the integer constructor takes an argument. If you pass it a string that contains digit characters, it will convert the string into the corresponding integer. And there you go. The string containing two and one becomes the integer 21. You can tell because there's no quotes around it. Since a function returns a value, you can call that function in line with another function, passing the return from the first function as an argument to the second. This can save some typing, and although it makes the line of code longer, sometimes it makes it clearer what you're trying to do, as it's all in one step. Let me show you an example. Here, I'm calling the input inside of the int constructor. The input function gets called first, and its response gets used as an argument to int. Then, of course, all of that gets stored in the age variable, replacing what's already there. Let me hit enter. There's my prompt. There's me typing a response. And let's look inside of age. The old value of age has been replaced with the new value, which is the integer 22. Let me quickly just prove that. Yep, it's an int. You can do the same thing with a float. This time, the result from input will get fed to the float constructor. Let me hit enter. There's the prompt. My response. It's been a long time since I've been 22, or 190 pounds for that fact. But lying to the REPL is allowed. Inside of the wait variable, you can see the response. Notice the decimal point indicating that this is a float rather than an integer. And of course, calling type confirms it. If you're assigning a float to a variable, you have to include the decimal point, otherwise Python assumes it's an integer, even if there's no decimal part. But since here you're explicitly converting to a float, it doesn't matter. Either way, you'll get a float. So. You get the same kind of thing if your number has a decimal place. The float constructor knows how to convert strings with decimal points inside of them. So far, I've been a good little user, typing in things that don't break the code. But I don't have to be. In the next lesson, I'll show you what to do if your user's a little bit naughty.